Amen. Wasn't that wonderful? Amen. I have the task of introducing our speaker for this morning. Many of you know him, but some of you may not know him that well. He's married. He has three beautiful children and a granddaughter that seemed to tug at his heart so much that he has to fly from here all the way to Dubai just to be with this little girl. He's a loving father, and he's a friend. He's a friend. He's humble. I've had the opportunity of working with him, and he's so amazing. He's calm. Sometimes I wish that I was as calm as he is, you know? He's just mellow all the time. But guess what? He loves the Lord. And he loves the Lord with all his heart. And I know that God has a special place for him and for each and every one of us. All we have to do is to trust him. And so, Brother Arcel and his praise team would minister to us. And right after that, you'll hear the man of God as he speaks to us through the word. Amen. God is good. All right. You know, I have a tremendous amount of respect and appreciation for our first elder, Elder Weaver. Looking forward to hear what thus said the Lord through Elder Weaver. But before we're going to uh, invite two young sisters, Abigail and Sarah, to share a selection. And then the praise team will follow them. Please welcome Abigail and Sarah. The body is 
your voices, every praise, every praise is to our God. A little louder.
Let's put the second verse on the screen just for the congregation. This is your turn to lift your voices. We'll try this. Ready? Praise him. Jesus. Oh, it's beautiful. For our sins. He suffered and bled. That's why we came to church to praise him because he is an awesome God thank you praise team for that song and then I'm gonna thank Abigail and Sarah and mom for that beautiful song Abigail and Sarah was just baptized a few months ago and now they start their own ministry for the Lord one day you may have to go and pay to hear them in concert. You don't know. So we thank God. Thank him for his love. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity of coming into your courts to worship you. We invite your presence in our midst. Come, Lord, and speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. In the book of John, chapter 12, verses 17 to 22, we just want to read, just want you to read with me a few of these verses. And for the next few moments, we will talk on the fact we want to see Jesus. John, chapter 12, see on the screen? Verses 17, let's read together. The people, therefore, that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. What did they do? They bear record. The next verse, for this cause, 
the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. Verse 19, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how he prevailed nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. Verse 20, And there was a certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. And the same, therefore, said to Philip, which was of Bethesda of Galilee, and desired him, saying what? What did they say? We want to see Jesus. These were Greeks. These were Greeks who wanted to see Jesus. Jesus had just finished healing quite a number of sick people. The lame, the blind, the dumb. But after raising Lazarus from the dead, the word went around like wildfire. The words went everywhere. The people that was with him, having seen him raise Lazarus from the dead, the Bible says they bore record. In other words, they had a personal testimony, a personal witness about Jesus. Their hosannas were initiated by the resurrection of Lazarus. And the people testified of the truth of that miracle. Yes, they had seen it all for themselves. Lazarus is back on the land of the living. Yes, he's here after being dead for four days. He's walking around. He's smiling. Something must be good. The eyewitnesses stirred up the multitude to join the cloud with a loud acclamation. This was the second group. The first group was the multitude of Bethany who saw Jesus as he healed Lazarus and then witnessed to a larger multitude who were pilgrims visiting town for the Passover. The second group went out of Jerusalem just to meet Jesus. The raising of Lazarus was the reason for them coming out to welcome Jesus. These Pharisees formed an opposition group. So here there was a couple of groups. The first, the disciples who stayed with him. Second, the multitude who were in Bethany when he healed Lazarus from the dead. And third, there was a multitude who were there with a prior company who came to see the resurrection of Jesus. And then fourthly, the Pharisees. They form what is called an opposition group, whose language in their verse implies that they were angry and despair about what Jesus was doing. The Pharisees showed up and they were baffled because they thought that they could find some people ready to lay hands on Jesus and deliver him unto their power. But instead, they find a multitude surrounding Jesus with joyful acclamations and saluting him as king of kings. And any attempt to arrest Jesus would raise up a tumult. And so the leaders appealed to Jesus, Jesus, can you just quiet the multitude, but they had no success. All they could do is to watch the procession and see their enemy enter Jerusalem in royal triumph. Jesus was stealing their attention. Hear them, the world is gone after him. The world is gone after him. These Pharisees hated the idea because Jesus 
was now getting all the attention. Some people hate the idea when you get the attention. It's okay when they get the attention, but when you get the attention, it's a problem to them. You know some people like that? Don't, don't say anything. Don't, don't say anything. See, the Pharisees wanted to get rid of Jesus' testimony. If they would kill Lazarus, then the testimony would go away. And so they came looking for Lazarus and for Jesus, because if they would get rid of Lazarus, then the next stop was to go after Jesus. But his time had not come yet. So Jesus just disappeared. Jesus was standing in the crowd, and then he just disappeared. No one knew where he went. He did not go into hiding, but he just disappeared from the crowd. Hear them again in verse 19. Perceive ye how he prevailed nothing. Behold, the world has gone after him. And while the Pharisees were upset, the Greeks came and told Philip, we want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. So here we are. One group hated him. Another group praising him. And the Greeks just wanted to get rid of him. They hated him. What is it that the Greeks heard about Jesus that made them want to see Jesus? About that time, Rome ruled the world. And the Greek culture was dominant in Rome. Greek literature was dominant in the Roman Empire. And Greek philosophy also dominated Rome. The Greeks had a rich culture of religion. And they also had a great, a great group of gods. There were gods everywhere for the Greeks. And they had Zeus. He was the great king of gods. They had Aquinas, the god of wisdom. They had the Aphrodite, the god of love and lovemaking and fertility. And yet these Greeks wanted to see Jesus. The Greeks had all sorts of scientists. They were not short on scientists. They had in the caliber of empiricals. They had some of the great orators. They were familiar with philosophers like Plato and Aristotle and Socrates. And yet, they wanted to see Jesus. There were philosophers who would go around and speak to anyone who would listen. But the Greeks were educated people. They were, they were among the very learned in society. They were not from the ghetto. They were skilled in orators, but they wanted to see Jesus. Let me read an excerpt for you from a Roman historian who filed a report to Caesar on the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus. He said, in Judea, I met a man whose name is Jesus. He was a man with an impeccable character. He said, I was more afraid of Jesus than a whole army. He said, Jesus could heal all manner of diseases, even raise the dead and return sights to the blind. He even cursed an orchard of fruit trees and they all withered to their roots. And then he said, Jesus had such great power, but he never used it to hurt anyone. He said the Jews were divided in their opinion of him. Some Jews claim him to be their deliverer and their, uh, from bondage. But he said the rich Jews hated Jesus. He said they cursed him behind his back and called him an Egyptian obiaman. The term they used was he was a necromancer. Pilate writing to Caesar, to Tiberius Caesar, emperor of Rome, noble sovereign, greetings. He said the events of the last few days in my province had been of such that I will give you full details as it happens. 
And I will not be surprised that in the course of time, this may change the history of our nation. He said, there's a rumor that a young man called Jesus, he appeared in Galilee in the name of the God who sent him. Pilate said, at first I was apprehensive of him. I thought that he would stir up the people against the Romans, but my fears were dispelled. He said, Jesus of Nazareth spoke more as a friend of the Romans than of the Jews. He said, one day as I was passing by, I saw a young man leaning against a tree, addressing a crowd. And he said, never have I seen such a serene countenance. Never have I read in the books of the philosophers anything that compared to the maxims of Jesus. He said a complaint was made against Jesus at the praetorium about his insolence. He said, I went to interview him and there was nothing about him that was repelling. Jesus of Nazareth, he said, your words are those of a sage. I don't know whether you have read Socrates or Plato, but this I know, that there is in your discourse a majestic simplicity that elevates you above the philosophers. And I said, wow. No wonder the Greeks came to see him. They came because philosophers can't help them to find peace for their troubled soul. Imagine you are searching for truth and all you get is this philosophical mumbo jumbo. They wanted the truth, the kind of truth that Pilate was writing about when he wrote to Caesar. There is in his discourse a majestic simplicity that elevates him above the philosophers. And so it is clear to me, I believe, that's why the Greeks came to see Jesus. They heard of his miracles and of his power. How he fed 5,000 people with a little boy's lunch and there were 12 baskets left over. They heard how he can walk on water. They heard that Peter went fishing one night and he fished all night and he caught nothing. But when Jesus showed up, he said, cast your net on the other side. And when Peter did, the boat starts sinking. There was so much fish. Oh, Jesus of Nazareth, the Greeks wanted to see him. They heard that funeral directors had to give back refunds because Jesus was raising their dead back to life. <laughs> they heard that doctors were complaining because Jesus was healing the people for free. They heard that one day Jesus went to the pool of Bethesda he saw a man sitting there for 38 years. He asked the man, do you want to be well? The man said, I was waiting for someone to help me. Yes, I want to be well. Jesus told him, pick up your bed and walk. And the man get up and start skipping all over town because Jesus was me. That's why the Greeks wanted to see him. These Greeks heard that a woman who was sick for 12 years Twelve long years, could not get help from the doctors until one day she showed up in town. And he was with a crowd and she didn't want to disturb them, so she slipped up and touched the hem of his garment. And she said all of a sudden, things changed. Even his garments was full of power. What a God. Oh, they heard that blind Bartimaeus was walking around town and testifying, once I was blind, but now I can see the light of the world is Jesus. And now I can see. They also heard that he was from eternity and that he was the Logos, the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. They heard all these things they heard that he created all things. 
and that he has the keys to eternal life. They heard that he came to save mankind. They failed to realize that he was a greater philosopher than Socrates. He is a more efficient scientist than Empiricals. He is a greater physician than Procriton. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life, and no man can come to the Father except they come to him. I can see Philip as the head of the church. And I can see the Greeks as a symbol of the world. The world is in bondage to the devil and is looking to the church to find Jesus. They're looking to the church to find hope and comfort. Jesus, the only source of wisdom for all of us. E.G. White wrote, a Christ-like life is the greatest argument that one can put forth in favor of Christianity. A Christ-like life is the greatest argument. Christians are known by the way they live. Christ is expecting us to live the life that expresses his character, not by the way we dress, but by the way we live. Christians are known by not only the way they live, but how they treat people. There's an old hymn that we used to sing some time ago. Do we live so close to the Lord today? Passing to and fro on lives busy way. That the world in us can a likeness see to the man of Calvary. Can the world see Jesus in you? Can the world see Jesus in me? You see, Christianity says... Do unto others as you would have them do to you. But you see, apostolic Christianity has done a number on God. But we must be able to point people back to him. He's the one who died for us. And this is what this group of witness was doing when they saw Jesus heal Lazarus. When they saw it, that he came back to life, they went and shared it everywhere. Everywhere they go. They would talk about Jesus. They would talk about his power. They would talk about what kind of guy he is. A rich Dutch merchant was seeking to find a, a diamond of certain kind to add to his collection. And a famous dealer in New York found one such diamond and called him to come and see it. So he flew immediately to New York just to see the expert. And the salesman who had the diamond tried to sell it to him and he explained everything he possibly can about the diamond. And the merchant decided that he wasn't going to buy it. But the owner was in the room, and the owner said to the, uh, the merchant, can I show you this diamond once more? And he agreed. The owner placed the diamond in his hand, and he looked at it. And as he was looking, the merchant was looking, and he began to explain all the details about the diamond. He explained how beautiful it is and how the man could not go home without it because it was so beautiful. He explained all the features and then the merchant decided that he was going to buy it. And so he bought it, placed it in his coat pocket. And then he said to the owner, how come the salesman couldn't sell me this diamond. He said to him, this salesman is the best in the business. He knows all about diamonds. He knows this for years and years. But there is one thing that I have that he doesn't. 
And if I could place what I have in him, I would double his salary. I would pay him twice as much. And so as the merchant continued to listen, he said, he knows all about diamonds, but me, I love diamonds. And that is the difference. You see, my brothers and sisters, we can tell people that we know about Jesus, we can tell them all we know, but if, if we don't love him, if we don't show them how much we love him, then it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter to Jesus if you love him, that love will be seen in others. People will know how much you love him because when you talk about him, you are so excited to talk about Jesus. And when you love Jesus, that's where ministry starts. That's where ministry starts, showing how much you love Jesus. If you ever feel like God has abandoned you, Philippians 4.13 has given us a good answer. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 1 John 4.11 said, Beloved, if God so love us, we ought also to love who? One another. If he loves us. So my question for you today is, do you love him? Do you, do you really love him? As Brother Asel comes to the piano, there's an old hymn that we used to sing some time ago. And it says, I think it's number 236 in the hymnal. It says, I love thee, I love thee. I love thee, my Lord. I love thee, I love thee, and that thou dost know. But how much I love thee, my actions will show. If you love him, it will show. People will see, it, and they will want to know him. Do you love him today? If you love him, just stand and sing this hymn with me. in technology number 236 we have it on the screen <laughs> love thee I love thee and that's the question that we need to ask ourselves do you really love him and if you do let's sing I love thee I love thee I
peace and my joy and my rest. Thy name be my theme and thy love be my song. Thy grace shall inspire both my heart and my song. Let's sing the verse. Oh, Jesus, my Savior. That we will get even more excited about this love. Others will get to know you because of it. The Greeks came because they wanted to know you. They wanted to know about your love and your compassion and your favor. What a mighty God you are. Drawing men to you. Father, we thank you for this opportunity of giving you our love because you first gave your love to us. Thank you for loving us and thank you for caring for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. will guard his children in his arms he carries them all day long praise him praise him tell of his excellent greatness praise him praise him ever in joyful song praise him praise him Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, for our sins He suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. Sound His praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellence. 
Yeah. 